So I'm Ian Dolphin. I'm the executive director of the Apario Foundation. Apario is an association of educational institutions and commercial partners that collaborate to produce and sustain software to support the academic mission. Today's webinar is an update from the Xerti project. Xerti is a content authoring tool set which produces interactive and accessible content. Uh, that content can play on the web or it can be integrated into another environment like Sakai, which is another one of our projects. But I don't want to go into too much detail and spoil Julian's thunder. So over to Julian Tenney of the Xerti project for our update today. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, so this afternoon, um, we would like to just present an update on the Xerti project since we came and spoke to the Perio community in Baltimore back in the summer. Um, since then, we've made our uh, first release as an Aperio project, so we released version 3 of Xerti Online Toolkits at the end of July. Um, and there's been a whole load of work going on since then, so it was just to sort of reprise where we're up to and um, to talk about some of the plans for the future and let you know about some of the things that we've currently got in development and talk about some of the initiatives and stuff that are going on in the community. Um, but really what we wanted to think about was what opportunities are there for us to um, collaborate with other Aperio projects. So this might be something that we need to pick up after the webinar today because we've got so few um, attendees today. That's not a problem. And you, you guys later on will be able to find us. Um, but we would like to know what opportunities there are amongst the different project teams for us to, um, to work together a bit more and see where we might be able to help each other out. We'd also like to find out and explore with people a little bit about how we can help you um, promote search online toolkits in your own institution. So I'm interested in what initiatives people have already got underway, if at all, um, to, to, to promote it and whether, whether there's any of that sort of activity going on and whether there's anything that we can do to help in terms of um, well, resources or access to anything or demos or whether we could drop in and do some webinars for some of your own groups of people. So I'm going to um, take you through some of the new features of Xerti version 3. And there is some release notes which I thought I'd saved in my presentation, but I haven't, so I'll just type them in. But if you open up the release notes, then you'll, you'll see this document, document that takes you through all, all of the new stuff in, in version 3. Version 3 was a significant update for us um, in that we have completely rewritten the editor to be HTML based. So this is part of our drive to remove Flash altogether from our ecosystem in terms of authoring tools and the playback. Um, we also updated the workspace and made that much more usable and addressed a couple of issues that have been around for a long time and added some more features to that. And we've redesigned the whole software as well, which I think is, a, is an improvement on where we are. Certainly, Ron and I looked back at some versions of toolkits from around 2010, and we couldn't believe what it looked like um, compared to what it looks like now. So it's good to see all that process, progress. Um, there are a number of new templates in <coughs> the suite of templates in the, in the Xerti Online Toolkit template. There's a new media lesson template, which is a really powerful template for displaying media and synchronizing the playback of that media to various things on the screen. So the idea would be that you might be able to have a video playing and be able to um, pause the video at certain points while you ask questions, or perhaps you want to synchronize the display of slides that supplement the content of a video or audio track um, as, as those pieces of media play. And um, we're starting to see some really interesting uses of that. So the decision tree template is a, is a, a standalone template, but it's also part of the Xerti Online Toolkit, which allows you to easily author um, branching content. We used it as a way of taking people through a situation where they were asked to um, assess a number of options. Um, it was built for a centre here at Nottingham, the Centre for Sustainable Technology, and they, they used it as a ready reckoner for, for walking people through situation where they had to answer various questions which would then lead to some advice um, but it could also be used for building sort of simulation type and if you've ever tried to create any of that content you'll know that creating it can get complicated very quickly 
Um, so that they're two, the, two of the, the, the more important additions to the template. We also rationalized all of the uh, suite of templates to remove some of the pages that had been developed in the past to support the flash runtime environment when we were using that. We don't need them anymore because there were things that we had to do in the past for certain types of content to work in the flash player. Now that everything's browser-based, we don't need to do that. And it's much easier to integrate other types of content um, in, in, into a toolkit's project. So an example of that would be where in the past we had used flash paper as a way of putting documents into um, <clears throat> into the toolkit project, then now PDF is a much better way of doing it and we can support PDF, things like that. So um, we've also added some registration um, stuff to uh, so that people installing Zerti Online toolkits are encouraged to register their install so that we know who's using the software. We haven't done that in the past for a number of reasons, but it's, it's interesting looking at the data that we're collecting from people installing the software now how global those users are. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot, a lot of installs that we wouldn't otherwise find out about. Um, previously, in order to find out who's using toolkits, because we wonder from time to time, then actually the best way of, or one, one way of doing it is just to simply Google for the text, welcome to Xerti Online Toolkits. And that picks up a lot of installs that have got that text, which is the de default text on the login page. And we found about several hundred institutions using that but of course it only picks up people that are using it in English and what we found looking and what's interesting about the data that we're picking up from registration is that about three quarters of them are international and non-English speaking installs um, and that's people that are using the, the various language packs to make Zerti Online Toolkits work in the language of their choice. So that's really been, been interesting to us and, and it shows that there's an awful lot of use of Zerti Online Toolkits that we're not always aware of um, and particularly in foreign languages so, for instance, we know that it's, that, that it's used in Japan, but I don't think we've had that much engagement with any Japanese users. Um, so, yeah, one, one example. So, anyway, if you look through the release notes, you can see in a bit more detail all of the stuff that went into version 3. We're planning on a, a release 3.1 sometime before Christmas. The work's been ongoing and we've fixed a whole load of issues. We've only got 22 bugs on our GitHub at the moment, and most of those are minor. We haven't got anything critical. So the project's in a really good state, and we want to just keep make, making sure that all of those um, um, improvements are getting flushed out through into the releases so that people are benefiting from the, the more robust code. So I think 3.1 will be the best release that we've ever made. Hopefully every release is the best release we've ever made. but and certainly feels like that. And we fixed a lot of issues that cropped up following version three. Um, so we will address all of those. But we've also got some new tentative new features that are going to see some more development going in there. But for instance, we have um, some responsive text so that we've started to work towards a more responsive content. Obviously, that's going to be the way forward and more and more important in the future. There's a lot of work when we look across the whole suite of templates to think about making everything truly responsive so that everything works on every device in a highly usable fashion. Um, but text has been an easy place to start so that on larger screens, the text is larger and, and it just displays much better um, doing that. So thanks very much to Ron for putting that in. We found themes to be very popular. That was one of the key new features in version three. Um, and already here at Nottingham, we've developed a couple of themes to support particular initiatives that, that, that felt the need to theme their, their work. Um, having built a couple myself, it's really easy to build them and really easy to just drop them into an install and make those themes available. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's been really good. Um, we've picked up a couple of our new developer. So Leonard Johnson has rewritten the setup utility. So we'll have an even better setup utility with version 3.1. So thanks very much to Leonard for that. And we've had loads of improvements put put through to um, GitHub from Plymouth and John Horn, who's a systems guy, I think, there. But thanks very much, John, for all the stuff that you put through the list over the last couple of months. That's been great. You picked up loads of detailed um, little, bit, little bits and pieces that on their own weren't necessarily that significant. But all of the fixes that you've put forward to us have been you know, quite, quite a, a big um, contribution. So thanks very much indeed. Um, we've got a couple of new interactions in, this, in the template. So we've got a sortable grid, um, a dictation exercise, which works with audio, 
and we're working on a new interactive text interaction. All of these are really good examples of where, where the team here at Nottingham are working with groups of academics across the university and listening to their needs and identifying what they want to do, identifying what can be done already and where things can't be done, working with them to build um, content. We find that leads to a lot of engagement from those groups of academics because we're, we're able to sort of grant their wishes if you like. So this week on Monday I ran a seminar all morning with some people from CELI which is the Centre for English Language Education. They teach international students academic English or English for academic purposes and they have an interest in um, using text more in an interactive fashion so they'll be able to present passages of text and being able to mark that text up into various sections. A simple example to illustrate what we're talking about, you might want to be able to highlight all the verbs in a text and have the user explore those verbs or you, you might want them to be able to <coughs> highlight other parts of speech or provide information about how an argument was put forward or about how a summary was put forward and those sorts of things. And what we find when we do that, obviously, is those those academics engage strongly with the with the project because they're getting new tools and they're getting their needs met. So there's a whole load of stuff in in development at the moment, and we will get that out there before Christmas sometime. And to give you some idea about the engagement across the University of Nottingham, and Ron has also added a stats module, and um, which gives you some basic reporting on um, activity across the across the install. And from that, we've found that in the seven years that we've been running toolkits in Ottingham now, we've had over three and a half thousand users. We've created eleven and a half thousand projects. Um, we have about four and a half thousand public or publicly accessible projects that have been created. Um, and so you can see that about a third of projects that are created, there's a lot of hello world and test and all that sort of stuff, but actually a third of them are turning into something that have been that have been set to view to the world. And I think in the last couple of days, we've just hit the two millionth play of our content. So we've had over two million visits to all the learning objects that we've, that we've created here. So it gives you some idea of the scale of engagement across the university here. It is significant and it's a great way of getting through to academics that have sometimes been reluctant to engage with technology um, for, for them to engage. So I'm just going to put a few links into the window now. So our main community website is at zerti.org.uk. That's where we'd encourage you to and go and engage with us as the forums there which have a lot of information now about existing issues and problems um, and that's probably one of the main places to engage with us. Um, there is some information on the Nottingham University's website about the Xerti project. Now, there's a couple of examples coming up now. There's a really good example of a project that uses all the page types. So that gives you some idea and we often use, we use that example when we're training academics as a way of showing them what can be done um, with the Xerti Online Toolkit and there's a similar example which has a lot of information about what can be done with the bootstrap template there. So there's two, two sort of fairly fully featured examples of the sorts of content that you can create. And then finally there's a link through to our GitHub stall and wiki where you're quite welcome to go and put, record issues or take the code and do all those sorts of things. So that was really all that I wanted to say in terms of presentational stuff today and um, just to sort of reprise the, the features that we released in the summer and to tell you a little bit about what we're working on currently um, with a view to a, a release before Christmas. Um, and what we wanted to think about for the rest of the webinar was those two questions that I posed at the beginning which is how do we, as a community, help you, the Apirio world, promote the Xerti Online Toolkits throughout your own institutions? And <clears throat> how can we better collaborate as a group of projects? So what, what is it that we can do to, uh, where, where are the synergies between the projects in the Apirio world? So now this we have Dave with us. So Dave, you have our full attention.
we're not trying to put you on the spot. <clears throat> Something I would add, Julian, if I may, and and I think it's it's still a, a big issue, and and I've, I've certainly mentioned this. I think when we were at the, the Perio conference in Baltimore, is the the whole thing about people, particularly learning technologists or those with a developer role, um, judging their opinion of Zerti on and comparison with other tools are missing the point that our, how our whole ethos is about empowering the non-specialist, the non-learning technologists, or the teachers and learners across an institution. Um, and those specialist tools are aimed at anyone and, and or, or are aimed at the specialists and they can use any number of tools. Um, and we all know that that's where Zerti fits in, empowering everybody else. And I think we, we fall really foul of a bias for other tools by those that have access to those other tools, ignoring the fact that actually their role is to support the wider community. Yeah, I think we, we certainly see that in that learning technologies, you're right, they have access to a number of specialist tools and probably a budget to pay for them. And they make their decisions based on, on their worldview. It's sometimes missed that these tools are readily accessible by a much wider group of people and they're highly suitable for their use. And certainly, you know, when, we, when I'm talking about 11,500 learning objects here at Nottingham, that's a vast upscaling of content production um, across the university. Certainly, really interesting projects are where students are the content creators and are working together in groups of groups to create content that addresses an assignment or that teaches what they found most difficult. You know, if you ask a group of students to work together to design some resources that teach the things that they found most difficult in the module, then that just ticks so many boxes around deep learning, social constructivism, cr critical thinking, you know, all, all of that good stuff. And I think I'm really pleased to see more of that stuff going on. Um, you know, we've done some of that stuff here at Nottingham. We've seen independent research validate the outputs of those sorts of initiatives. And then we saw the HEA sponsor a number of projects out in the community last year, and all of those reports were available to be written up. And there are a few bumps in the road for people doing those sorts of things, but on the whole, the results are really compelling. So yeah, I, I agree with Ron. That sometimes it's the, the message is that this is a this is a tool that is sort of slightly different to the, the tools aimed squarely at learning technologists or content specialists. Yeah, and I wonder if I might ask you, are you able to speak? Has your audio problem gone away? Yeah, sorry. I uh, I had a WebRTC problem. I mean, I think that I think there are a few routes through this, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I, I agree with the comments that um, it would be really useful to showcase some of the the really compelling content that's been created. You know, a few examples, probably quite different examples, would... Uh, would be useful, and we could do that through a webinar, or we could do it through an Aperio teaching and, and learning call that was was opened out. It doesn't doesn't really doesn't really matter. Um, I think it would be good to involve some folks from the community who've experience of using tools like Lessons within Sakai and Xerti. Um There are people around like that. Patrick Lynch at the the University of Hull has used both and has quite a strong perspective on how they're very complementary. And I, I think in terms of the the Aperio community itself, it's the complementarity that we really have to to emphasize. Because I think Xerti brings something quite powerful, not just to uh, Sakai, but to, to other LMSs. So I mean, I think you know we've we've gone through Xerti has gone through the incubation process now. You've had exposure at an Aperio conference. We've done a couple of webinars. 
I think it's time to to try to push out into the community through a variety of uh, of different routes. But certainly, I suspect that the the content story showing the examples of what can be created are actually the the critically compelling factor in attracting members of our community and, and members of other communities as well come to that. Sure, and providing opportunities for people in the Xerti community to to bring what they've been working on to the Apirio community. Yeah, I wonder whether we could do some some sort of online events or and what we might be able to do about that. The awards might provide an opportunity for us to do that. I'm really hoping to get some good engagement amongst our own community and get some really good entries to the Apirio Awards. And we intend to run our own um, event around that um, so that we can reflect all of the good stuff that's happening in the Xerti community back to the Xerti community, um, but also that we can put those entries forward to the Apirio Awards next year. So Dave's we'll asked a question. Dave's asked a question, Julian, about um, integration of, of Xerti and Sakai and how that might look. Could you perhaps briefly describe how the integration works with Moodle um, at this point? Because that might give some illustrations which would be useful for others. Yeah, um, well, here at the University of Nottingham, then we do have LTI that joins the two tools together. But to be frank, Moodle's implement, uh, implementation of LTI isn't the most friendly for end users. Um, and so what we find is that running the two systems side by side actually works. And there isn't an awful lot that you need to do in terms of integration. Although I would like to explore with some of the LTI experts in the Apirio community what opportunities we might be missing. Because I don't know um, LTI as well as some of the acknowledged experts that are in this world. So we, we run Xerti Online Toolkits as a standalone application and users that want to put that content into Moodle will simply do that through a web link um, or through embedding or any, any of the native tools. That means that the content remains um, editable in toolkits and it also means that you can surface that same content in lots of other places where you might want this content to go. I think that's that's very useful, um, and we should we should kind of make sure that that gets pushed out through um, perhaps through the uh, the Aperio newsletter. I, I'd encourage you to to go onto YouTube and look at the I think they're currently in the Sakai channel, but Chuck Severance gave a talk at the um, Sakai virtual conference last week, which had some very interesting points about the future generally of learning systems. But I think there are some interesting points in there about directions that LTI is taking that you would find uh, useful. Indeed, that everybody on the call would find useful. Yeah, I'll, I'll avail myself of that. Yeah, the problem that we have is, uh, is in, in Moodle, the LTI implementation just doesn't make any sense as an end user. When you look at the dialogues that you have to click through to make that work, it's just so much more friendly to paste a link into a web resource activity and add that to your course. So yeah, um, I've, I found Chuck's presentation in Baltimore really interesting as well. I mean, I'd, I'll add to that. I, I was working with an organization yesterday that are, are Blackboard users. Um, and prior to the, to the day, I was um, setting up some examples in one of their Blackboard courses to to um, discuss the differences between linking embedded and school um, and right. ultimately that's all part of the mix and it's just so much easier and more beneficial to simply um, embed or link and leave the school bits the, the grade book tracking and everything else to either separate learning objects that you do export um, or quizzes, activities that are direct in the VLE, whatever that VLE might be, um, to keep the keep dirty for the, the formative stuff. Um, and everyone you have that dialogue with gets that and they, they get the, the benefits of doing that. And, and the biggest barrier to improving resources is, you know, if, if you've got that export published metaphor that those you know the majority of tools have whereas with Xerti 
have a Xerti learning object in 20 courses, update it once, and it's instantly updated in all of those courses if you've linked or embedded it. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, it's just some such a simple argument, but we we keep on seeming to have that, you know, have that discussion, explain those benefits. Um, obviously, XAPI will be the long-term answer to that. What are other vendor competitors to what Xerti does out there? What would you say are the main competitors to what we've we've got, Ron? Uh, the 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 common almost daily discussion I'm having is people that use, as I was hinting earlier, use tools like Articulate Storyline, um, yeah. and miss the fact that that's never going to be a tool for everybody in an organization because of the license cost because of the complexity of it um i have to say i use articulate storyline all of us that are developers use a whole range of tools we don't we don't look for that one tool solution and even with xerti you know we're not suggesting it's the only tool people should use but it's a fantastic tool to use together with other tools and i think people miss the point that actually if they're a specialist developer they can create almost identical content with um Xerti than you can with storyline and i've started to put together quite a few examples that prove exactly that um in fact i'll paste a, a link into one that we, we were looking at earlier um which is basically, um, and the story is in there, it's just a, a copy of a PowerPoint template from the Articulate site. Um, and I've kind of just used some CSS to to make one of the Xerti page types look exactly the same. Now, there's nothing particularly special about that particular example. But I have quite a few other examples that I've started to work on that are far more interactive and, um, and do mimic, and in some ways, um, act better than the articulate equivalent now again you know to re-emphasize the point it's not either or for learning technologists they can use any combination of tools they want but for practitioners for students you know realistically Xerti is the best tool that you know you can provide them with because yeah. it's providing them with everybody yeah a couple of thoughts on that and when we were engaging with the well what to do with the open source stuff and you know is this a apache is it a pirio what do we do we discovered that there isn't an open source content authoring tool i was really surprised about that um and that we're almost unique there, there is very little else and there's certainly nothing as rich or as mature or as established as what we've got which did, did honestly come as a surprise to me but you know, there isn't really anything out there i don't know why there isn't why there aren't more open source projects that do content creation. The other thing is that being able to extend, because everything's open, and it's relatively easy to extend, certainly the Xerti Online Toolkit with new types of interactivity and content presentation templates, then you can do exactly what I was talking about um, earlier when we were working with a group of academics that have identified a wouldn't it be great if moment and within a week or two, then we're gonna be able to put those tools into their hands and they're gonna be able to create content that specifically meets their needs. So we get such a great engagement from that group when we're able to work in that way with them. Um, and you can't do that with a commercially provided piece of software. Well, that might be uh, a good place to, to wrap up. Dave, I don't know whether you've got any other questions or points you'd like to make at this point. Well, thanks everybody for this, what turned into a, a round table webinar, I think is how we'll build that. Um, I'll get this up on YouTube as soon as I can. Generally speaking, that's within a couple of days. Uh, and thanks very much for attending and participating thanks thanks very much yeah thanks